Now, so good afternoon. You are very welcome to today's event within the Pride Talks History series. This is a collaboration between the Little Museum of Dublin, EPIC, the Irish Immigration Museum, the National Library of Ireland and Molly, the Museum of Literature Ireland. The series has been presented in association with Dublin LGBTQ plus Pride. Now today we are being joined by the Museum of Literature Ireland for a talk entitled Reflections on Past, Present Pride. So Past, Present Pride is a series of conversations that celebrates LGBTI plus writers. In today's conversation, Dr. Paul Dalton and Molly's digital curator, Benedict Schlepper Connolly, are going to speak to Professor Margaret Kelleher about the series so far and to reflect on some of the interviews with they, that they've had with writers such as Emma Donahue, Colin Tobin, and Mary Dorsey. After this conversation, Benedict, the digital curator for the Museum of Literature Ireland, is going to join me to answer any questions that you may have. So please do take the time to put them into the chat function and we'd be delighted to do that. But for now, I give you um, Dr. Paul Dalton, Benedict Stepper Connolly, and Professor Margaret Kelleher. Hello, you're very welcome here to the Molly Courtyard Garden. Um, Molly is the Museum of Literature Ireland here in UCD Newman House on St. Stephen's Green. Uh, and my name is Benedict Schlepper Connolly. I'm the digital curator here at Molly. Um, this is an edition of Pride Talks History, and we're very happy to present Pride Talks History together with the Little Museum of Dublin, with EPIC, the Immigration Museum, the National Library of Ireland, and of course, Dublin Pride uh, or Dublin LGBTQ plus Pride. Um, with me today are Dr. Paul Dalton and Professor Margaret Kelleher. Um, Professor Margaret Kelleher is the Chair of Anglo-Irish Literature at UCD, as well as Chair of the Board of the Irish Film Institute, and her latest book is The Mom Trasna Murders. Oh. And uh, Dr. Paul Dalton is a clinical psychologist, teacher, writer, speaker, and Head of Psychology at the St. Vincent's University Hospital, uh, and Associate Professor of, in the School of Psychology in UCD as well. And Dr. Paul Dalton is the presenter of Past, Present, Pride. Uh, and I'm delighted to have these two great colleagues with me today to discuss Past, Present, Pride. Uh, I should also say that Past, Present, Pride is a collaboration with UCD's uh, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion programme. Uh, and it's a really lovely way to shine another light on this subject. So um, I suppose uh, to, to begin Speaking about Past, Present, Pride, a series that we, we started uh, nearly a year ago at this stage, uh, I know Margaret is going to ask some, some tough questions of the two of us. Yes. Um, so <laughs> so <laughs> that might get things Benedict. underway. Um, I'm delighted to be here and to, and to support the initiative. Uh, and in a way to turn the tables, it's going to be a pleasure to interview Paul, now interviewee <laughs> rather than interviewer, uh, as patrons of the series know. Uh, and indeed to turn the tables on you, Benedict, <laughs> and to bring you from behind the camera to in front of the camera to really tell us more about the series. Could I begin by asking you the significance of the series and, and how it relates to Molly's programming? Well, I suppose for anybody that's been to Mali, um, there's, uh, and in terms of the history of, of Mali's development, um, there's always been an emphasis on certainly acknowledging the literature of the past, and 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 there's a, there's, there's there are very strong focuses on that. But there's also a, like a real a real uh, desire to to turn the lens onto contemporary Irish writing as well, mm. uh, and and that that's experienced throughout the museum, but also through our, our digital programming and our learning programming as well. Um, so Past, Present, Pride is, is really just, just a chapter in, in Molly's uh, um, programming around that. Um, but it's an important one and it takes, it takes, in some cases, writers that are very well known mm -hmm. uh, and that have been in the, in the public sphere for, for a long time or a short time, but, but th th there's certainly a, uh, there's certainly an existing perspective on these writers. And it takes, it takes a, a, different, a different angle on, on their lives and their work. Um, and that's, that's through their experiences um, uh, as, as LGBTQ plus uh, writers. So, um, so in a way, that's a very important part of, of Molly's programming, um, really taking something that is known and, and shining, shining a different light on it and, and sort of 
trying to get in under the surface and, and uh, investigate a little bit deeper and, and uh, from, from, you know, uh, trying, to, trying to explore in under what is, what is familiar. It, it's been such a delight as a, a, a watcher of the series to have that sense of, of the lens being being placed differently. And let's come back to that and, and the power of that in a few moments. But a second part of the genealogy really of the series, Paul, is that it's a partnership between Molly and, and UCD, specifically the initiative in equality, diversity and inclusion. Mm. So could you tell us a little about that mm. and mm. the significance mm. of the series? For UCD's program, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a very important um, a very important piece of the the program in UCD around equality, diversity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And as you, you, you know, Margaret, the university's in, intention uh, to increase uh, diversity uh, and to become more more equal mm -hmm. uh, and more inclusive um, is a very serious commitment that the university have undertaken. Um, I chair one of the subgroups, the university subgroups of that, the LGBTIQ subgroup of that. And a couple of years ago, we were thinking about kind of about visibility. Mm. Um, how, how do minorities become visible and, and tell their stories? Um, and then we began to think about all of the wonderful writers who had been through UCD, LGBTQ writers who had been through UCD, and thought, wouldn't it be really interesting to look at their lives from a, a past, uh, present uh, pride. Really with that understanding that actually um, we, f for some people, this, 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 this is Pride Month, um, but there isn't a full stop after that, you know? Um, and certainly in, in our little nation and in our, in our university, there's been a long uh, and difficult pathway mm. to a degree of pride. So we wanted to capture that um, and and I, I think as a psychologist, I think, you know, we, we don't always do a wonderful job. Um, in fact, um, a lot of the time we don't do a good job at all with diversity or telling the story beneath the story. Mm. Um, and in, in many ways, my, 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 my sense is that that's done um, sometimes better uh, by artists. Mm. So really to, 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 to capture that. Um, and, and we're better to do that than with our colleagues in, in, in Mali. And we've had four episodes to date from Emma Donoghue, Colm Tobin and through to Mary Dorsey and, and most recently this week uh, Adiba uh, Adjur Gadar, whose name <laughs> um, is, 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 I know, a, a name I'm learning and that I know is going to f feature so much in, in the syllabi and curricula um, of, of, of time to come. And as we take this moment to kind of pause uh, at the four episodes, Benedict, do you see points of connection from, from your perspective as the, the digital curator? And, and, and have they surprised you, the, the points of connection? Yeah, I have to say each one has actually surprised me individually and, and, and together. Um, there is, I mean, it's a, it is a, the four to date have been a very diverse uh, selection, mm. really, of, of writers. Um, which is something we always wanted to do mm. as well, to, um, to, to really look at it from as many angles as we could. Um, but I think there is, there have been one or two things that have, have jumped out again and again. One of the things that's really, well, I, I suppose to begin with, we should say that one of the things is that each of these writers is, is at a stage in their, in their lives where they're comfortable doing an interview mm. uh, mm. about their sexuality, um, mm. which, which uh, is, really says that there are probably many others that aren't as well that that we have yet to speak to uh, perhaps um so that is something that they have in common <laughs> yes, you know is yeah. that the, that this is a conversation yeah. that we're having and uh and you would like to think that that's a conversation that every writer it, it, that identifies as lgbtq plus can have but i, I think maybe we're not there mm. yet mm. um another thing that really has struck me is the importance of family in each of in each of their lives um, and each in each of their their story, whether it's um, um, coming out in the first place or or, or struggling with that moment or um, um, being being much for decades down the line uh, and, and being in a position where they can reflect um, and how important the responses that their uh, 
families mm. um, gave them have been in, in, in some cases perhaps difficult, in some cases very, very supportive or mm. understanding, in some cases even very surprising to them. I remember Emma Donoghue's story, um, mm. yes. how, how uh, surprised she was at her mother's own reaction. Um, and then Mary Dorsey. Having Dor worried about it exactly for a number for of so years. Long, yeah. 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 But then yeah. Mary Dorsey's story being very much, much more difficult, but but ultimately also, you know, a very, very, uh, a very, very, in a way, sort of meaningful mm. Um, mm. Um, resolution, I suppose, mm -hmm. just in, in some way uh, yeah. to her own story. And, and Mary Dorsey, Dorsey spoke a lot about her mother um, and how important that relationship was to her. So that's something that's really come across all of the interviews, I think, uh, mm -hmm. to me is just how important, how important the immediate, the immediate uh, family uh, is in, in that moment and then throughout their, throughout their lives. Yeah, yeah. And coming back to that point of, of, of literature and, 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 and the significance of literature, it's a, it's a question I wanted to ask you both. Um, obviously, my own day job is as a teacher of literature and there have been so many I suppose, treasures or gems really in the episode so far about the role of literature and um, as a form of transformation, um, also as, as a form of connection. So again, I suppose to stay with you on that, Benedict, did, did that surprise you or I suppose in a way that's such a common theme in Molly anyway, but the, were there, there moments that surprised you about the role of the, of the literary or are the artistic for, for all four of these writers? Yeah, I mean, I think there's um, there's a sense in which, you know, all of their work has been inevitably shaped by their the story of their own sexuality mm. uh, and their their experience yeah. with it. And I suppose you realise you can't really get away from that. I mean, even mm. even this week, most recently, listening to Adiba speak. Um, um, it, it, it's very, very difficult to separate out her her work from her own experience, mm. you know, mm. um, which which I suppose, taking a different kind of thematic mm. subject, mm. It, it's much more it's much easier to to create that distinction mm. uh, with the writer. So, to some extent, they're they're we say we we talk to them about their life and their work, but it's very difficult to to keep those two mm. apart yeah. um, when it when it when it comes to, to their sexuality and the sexuality in the mm. in in their writing. Mm. Um, I mean that's, that's that's sort of a very a very vague answer to your question, no, Margaret. No, but no, I, I think as you say about it, Adiba's um, comments there, I think, you know, they're going to resonate with us for a long time. That that powerful comment she made of sitting in Theatre L and looking around and and realizing, you know, that she was then the only person of colour I mean, thankfully, just even in the couple of years since Adiba's graduated, you know, our, our student enrolment is, is more diverse, but not enough. Mm. Um, so the very fact of her interview will hopefully mm. encourage other future students. And particularly, as you say, in her writings, the fact that she's writing in young adult fiction, mm -hmm. you know, she's reaching an audience that must become our future students in UCD. So I very much hear what you're saying, that the, the writing and the life actually aren't aren't separable. Um, mm, I, I think mm, that's very true. Mm, what yeah. about you, Paul? Yeah, I mean, gosh, I, you know, I mean, Benedict was talking about, you know, the, the role of kind of family and the role of community and those early relationships with parents and how we navigate mm. all of those in order to form some kind of cohesive identity that can take me through the world. Mm. Um, and, and in the interview with the Diba earlier on, you know, just that the absence of a mirror. So when I can't see myself in the world, in, in literature or in popular mm. culture, it's kind of like I don't exist. Um, so, so really, I think, Margaret, this, this series, this endeavour is really about, um, about providing a mirror. Mm. Um, and all that happens there with the, the, the validation and actually the capacity of a human being to flourish mm. when they realise. And Deepa said at one point, you know, I sat in Theatre L mm. and I felt lonely. I felt alone. Mm. Um, and, and my God, um, has she coped with that in incredible ways. But that's not always the reality. Mm. Um, 
the, the, these little human beings that we are, we flourish in community when we're connected. Mm. Um, and, and I suppose, I, could, I mean, you, the, 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 the history of silencing and the history of shame mm. that this country has inflicted on people who mm. were different. Mm. Um, in, in, in some ways, I see what we're doing and part of this project yeah. as a way to, to, to begin to even approaching to undo some of that yeah. uh, and, and the harm in that and to, and to celebrate and yeah. to, to celebrate the lives that are, that, that are emerging, uh, the diversity that's emerging. I mean, it seems so fitting that we're having this conversation in the context of pride, because again, I think that word pride resonates so much through the scene. It's, it's yeah. pride in resilience. Um, it's, yeah. it's pride in, in living with, as I say, a number of, of, of negative emotions that also come through the series of, of silence, of invisibility. Yeah. Mary Dorsey's story coming back, as Bendick mentioned, mm. about, about mothers, the yeah. story of the abuse, the vitriol that, that her mother experienced. I mean, for you as a psychologist, Paul, I, I wanted to ask you what your view is as to the importance of these writers' voices being heard mm. in the public arena uh, at this particular moment, one of the themes throughout the series has also been writing and confinement, uh, writing during COVID. So what do you see as, as the importance of the series right now? Yeah, as, 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 we, as we're in Pride Month, as we are, as we are celebrating, um, and, that, and, and, and that line between the, the, the personal uh, and, and the public, the private and the public, and... For so many of us, mm -hmm. um, and indeed for so many of the people, the people that we've interviewed, it's been it's been so porous, and um, and and in some ways, I think that's where that's where the energy is, and that's where the life is, and that's where the dynamic is, um, and and I hope I hope that our series has been able to is is able to capture that in a way that that that's respectful, um, and that is life affirming and life giving to those who, who have been silenced or those who are without voice. Um, because as, as, as we know, it's not all pride, you know. Um, I think the last 16 months have been an incredibly difficult 16 months, um, particularly uh, for LGBTQ people, younger people. Um, I mean, we, I think we know that. It's been, a, it's been a very challenging time, a lot of isolation for people. Um, so certainly our, our hope is that in capturing these stories that we have done over the last 16 months, that um, they, they, they can provide um, a, a way out. They can provide um, a, a vision, a mirror for oneself in the world. Yeah. So in a way, as we finish past, present pride and indeed future, uh, a closing question to you, Benedict, about how these resources will, will be available in the future. Mm. So, I mean, it's something you said earlier on, and both of you, I think, have, have, have touched on is the importance of this as an archive as well. So while we see this very much made for the, the audience that's here with us this week, it's also very much documenting these stories for, for the future. Um, and I suppose as a museum, uh, we're very interested in collecting things. Um, historically, maybe that might have been uh, artifacts or bones or whatever it might be. But I suppose in my particular case, I'm very interested in the whole area of digital collecting and and uh, what we can what we can capture and hold for f future future audiences here at the museum. So past, present, pride is certainly uh, uh, there's there's an ambition there around that from from our point of view as well. Delighted to hear that. Yes, Thanks, Benedict absolutely. and Paul. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. And with that, we will uh, draw to a close this edition of Pride Talks History. My thanks very much to, uh, to Professor Margaret Keller Pleasure. and to Dr. Paul Dalton for joining me today to discuss Past, Present, Pride. We're delighted that Past, Present, Pride is a collaboration with UCD's uh, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion programme. Uh, and you can, you can watch all previous editions of Past, Present, Pride at molly.ie forward slash past present pride. It's also available as a podcast from uh, your favourite podcasting platform. My thanks also to our partners on Pride Talks History, um, the Little Museum of Dublin, Epic, the uh, Migration Museum, um, and the National Library of Ireland, as well as Dublin LGBTQ plus Pride. Uh, thanks again and see you soon.
Uh, Benedict, thank you so much. That was, um, how are you? Hi, Sarah, how are you doing? I'm afraid I'm in a much less uh, glamorous location today. Uh, I am delighted to see you. I wish I was in the Molly Courtyard, but... <laughs> I, I was particularly fond of looking at the car, courtyard. You put a huge hankering on me to go and sit down and have my lunch in the uh, yeah. soon. That was such a delight. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with Paul and Margaret to have that conversation. Um, I see questions coming in, so I'm going to just jump straight into them. But if anyone else does have questions, please do type them in. It will take a little bit of time now. Um, so you're, I, I was really delighted to hear you say that the archive is up online and so guests will be able to go back and go back into those conversations. But I do have someone who's uh, written in to say, Professor Margaret stated how important these stories are for visibility. Um, so kind of to give someone a taste who hasn't listened into these conversations yet, with the authors in the series, is there a particular focus on the coming out stories or what is the overall focus of each of the conversations? That's a, that's a really interesting question, Sarah. Um, there isn't a particular focus on coming out stories, I would say. And I think it's certainly, uh, there, there's at least one in which that isn't really talked about uh, in a lot of detail um, for whatever reason. Um, that was the one this week with, with Adiba Jagadar. Um, so there isn't, it's not necessarily that there's a focus on it. Na naturally enough, it does come up um, um, and, and for, for various reasons, I think, um, but it is interesting. I mean, something that really that really did come up this week with uh, speaking with uh, Adiba Jagadar was that importance of seeing yourself in in the writing. Um, and and in her case, it was I guess it was a combination of both um, um, being being queer and and also uh, being Muslim. Um, and and being in Ireland as well. So um, all of these things together, it was very very difficult for her. Um, um, as a young adult, in particular, to see herself in work, and and in a way, in a way, she's been, cre you know, her work is is creating, is is, is filling that gap. Um, it it really makes you think of, and this kind of came to my mind while I was listening to you speak. This kind of this notion that you can't be that which you can't see, and there is this kind of role model responsibility when you are kind of in a public space and you know you have a platform of that sort and that kind of comes back to one of the questions that was asked here um and so maybe it's it's probably from molly's perspective that you might answer this question you know how have you seen young people and i, I noticed that adiba writes young adult fiction you know how have you seen young people engaging with literature to try and help them to understand and kind of navigate their own place in the world yeah, um, I mean, I suppose we, in our experience, I mean, beyond Past, Present, Pride now as a museum, you know, we we engage with with young people across a, a number of different ways, both simply as visitors uh, to begin with. As for, sometimes it might be their first encounter with with uh, a, a number of writers and maybe specifically work uh, centering around LGBTQ questions. Um, um, but then also through our learning program, we would we would do a lot of work with young people as well. Um, it's interesting just that point about what you said uh, about you can't be what you can't see. Um, I know. I mean, just even just taking a quick scan of um, Adiba's social media accounts, for example, it's full of comments from people saying, "I you know I didn't know that this was possible," or "I you know I've been looking for some kind of validation," basically. Uh, of the, of the way that I've been seeing the world, um, and and yeah, it's 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 it it, it 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 seems a really really important thing to be able to to be able to see a reflection of yourself. Um, so I think that's yeah, that's something that's re particularly struck me this week uh, listening to Adiba speaking, but also with the other with the other writers. And even just kind of on this whole idea of kind of embracing the responsibility, I, I thought it was quite an interesting choice that you ended up working with a psychologist on this project. Yeah, um, it is really interesting. I, I mean, one of the things about uh, Paul Dalton um, is that he has, he has a really, really wonderful kind of compassionate manner. Um, and it makes it makes the interview interviewees feel very, very comfortable. And, it, you know, I think it I think that's really important because, you know, it's taking a very specific focus on a very personal aspect of their lives. 
um, in a way that a lot of a lot of, I suppose, literary interviews might be more focused more generally on the work. Um, so it's important that it's a really safe kind of space for people to talk about uh, talk about these subjects, you know. And so there's there's just a I guess just a personality about Paul Dalton that that that, that makes that really really successful. Um, um, but also I, I just think it's really interesting to approach it from the point of view of his discipline as a psychologist, uh, and and it it gives you a you know it's. I won't call it a non-literary discipline at all, but but it just gives you a different angle on the on the on the literary subject, uh, and I think that's always really interesting to do, um, to take another discipline and kind of kind of place it on top of another, and uh, uh, and I think just put, you know Paul's perspectives around people's experiences in these moments uh, is just really really valuable and, and very uh, it's a very uh, as I said compassionate way of of looking at looking at it. And I think the interdisciplinary nature of it is really, it's a wonderful way to think about it, and especially with the relationship that Molly has to UCD, that you are able to work across the humanities. Um, and I, I think kind of this idea of visibility, which you, the three of you spoke about during that conversation, is really, I guess, a really important part of what's going on here. And um, I think looking at, you know, mixing conversations around equality with history, but then also literature as you're doing through this series. Um, I, how have you as an organization or as a collective been thinking about the role that the, I guess, history, creative outputs, literary writing can have in actually supporting the way we head in the future? I don't know if that's yeah I mean I mean it, it's a uh, you know I suppose we're really lucky to work with literature as a subject um that seems like a kind of an obvious thing to say but uh you know we we it's not necessarily exclusively about stories but it's it's uh that's that's sort of telling telling stories is a big part of it you know um and telling stories is a really important part of our of our culture and as our experiences as human human beings i mean that's just very general um but i think literature has a role in terms of helping us understand how we make our way through through our lives you know uh, i think it's a really important role and so um especially if you, if you take uh people's experience uh, lgbtq plus experiences um you know we need we need that kind of reflecting point we need something that helps us understand other people's experiences i mean for i mean just for for an example you know i did this in many cases they're not experiences that i have had uh, and so i've learned a huge amount just from just from watching this series over the last over the last uh, year or so um so i think yeah i think the museum has a has a has an important role through its subject in in helping us helping us kind of understand ourselves and, and others very very much so and kind of when you you referenced there a moment ago your own work as the digital curator for molly um mm. one of the questions that someone wrote in kind of is kind of asking a little bit about how your own work works as well and um, their question is is it possible to form a sense of community with these authors and these stories at their center as reading can be quite a solitary activity? So I wonder how does the work of digital curation, for example, support making that solitary act a bit more communal? Yeah, that's that's a really, really interesting uh, question. And um, we actually just last night, we had the first edition of our uh, new book club, um, Ulysses for the Rest of Us. So if anybody wants to finish reading Ulysses for the first time or finally finish it, um, now is the time. Um, um, but it is really interesting. You know, we had hundreds of people who each have their own personal experience of the book uh, and a very private reading is, a, is such a private exercise you know often mostly um, and yet there's this kind of opportunity to come together and discuss it communally as you say um, and that's that can be really really valuable so so it's not about kind of negating the, the personal experience I think um, I think all of us for most of us reading it is a very kind of private uh, um thing that we sort of associate with solitude and other things like that uh, um uh, but it's about kind of adding adding context sometimes and offering ways to you know sometimes it'll be giving people a first experience of a writer but then they go off and read the book 
or it'll be uh, about giving people a shared space to kind of reflect on uh, reflect on what they've what they've read. So, um, but yeah, it's a very interesting kind of conundrum to how to make something something communal out of something that's essentially uh, uh, not. <laughs> yeah. but it's a fascinating challenge to be facing. Um, and I do see um, the final question that I see that's come in here is one of our attendees has said they thought this was a really wonderful talk and it stroke it strikes them that at its heart past present pride seems to affirm stories and experiences um, and so this attendee was just wondering if you could speak for a moment about you know how your curatorial program seeks to further this mission or kind of include this messaging within it yeah um well I mean, past, present, pride. I suppose is just it's just one strand of of our of our programming. Um, we do look at all of our programming through, I suppose, what you might call an EDI lens, um, and increasingly so. And, and that's not to say that you know we're we're perfect or that we've we've solved this, um, but but you know we we really try and put that filter over over our programming work. So that doesn't. I mean, on the most basic sense, you know. You know, we look at sort of things like gender balance and so on um, um, as closely as possible. But we, you know, we've we really would acknowledge that it goes much further than that, um, and and we make every attempt really to 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 make sure that 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 uh, that kind of EDI lens is there all the time. Um, and I think that's you know that's something that we have to work really hard at as well. It's not something you can just sort of decide overnight and, and make it happen. But I think past, present pride is certainly something we're really proud of. We're really proud of the collaboration as well with, with UCD's EDI program you mentioned there. I mean, I'm not sure how many would be familiar with, with us as a museum, um, but, but we are a subsidiary of, of, of UCD. Um, and so we have many kind of value, very valuable relationships with the university um, that are wonderful to have. Um, within the humanities but also beyond the humanities across the university and it, it really it's 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 fascinating to watch your programming i think kind of we you know i i, I do find it's really quite in, incredible but it's um to people who have with us today and perhaps are maybe hungry to go back and watch the um the conversations that you've spoken about here this afternoon where can they see them yeah, just go to molly.ie forward slash past, present, pride, or one word, um, and they're, they're, they should all be there. Oh. Adiba Jagadar's interview will be up there uh, within the next couple of days. Yeah, we just, we, we, we premiered it the other night, so we'll have it there soon. Brilliant, can't wait. It's, um, well, Benedict, this has been really very fascinating. I really sincerely appreciate you taking the time. So thank you so, so much for getting involved. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, thanks very much for hosting us. Oh, we're delighted. Um, but that will bring us to a close for another week of Pride Talks History. Um, so just reminding that this is a series collaboration between the Little Museum of Dublin, Epic, the Irish Immigration Museum, the National Library of Ireland and the Museum of Literature Ireland, Molly. And um, it's been presented in association with the Dublin LGBTQ plus Pride. Now, next week, we are going to be joined by one of my own colleagues, Fiona Brennan from the Little Museum of Dublin, is going to host a talk titled Queer Dublin. So we will see you all again next week. But for now, sincerely, 